Why do healthcare markets fail? How is healthcare different from regular products like cars and toothpaste where market dynamics translate into what we call allocative efficiency? And what is allocative efficiency? What factors impact on the overall supply and demand for healthcare at a national level? Stick with me, we'll dig into all of this over the next few minutes. Before we look at healthcare, let's look at regular garden variety market dynamics. Where the market is in equilibrium, in other words, the price and the quantity are being correctly determined by supply and demand then it's the case that there are no resources being wasted, and we call this allocative efficiency. And for most garden variety products, this works incredibly well. There is a relationship between the price that a product has been sold for and the quantity of that product that consumers will buy. At lower prices, people will buy more products, and if the price goes up, they'll buy less. We think of this relationship as the demand curve, Think of it as the general appetite in the marketplace for a product at a point in time. And if that product suddenly becomes more popular, then the demand will increase. And at the new demand, a higher quantity will be purchased for each price point. It's also true that the cost of producing a product, which is the minimum amount that a supplier can reasonably sell it for, is dependent on the quantity that gets produced. Once economies of scale have been exhausted, the marginal cost of production goes up with the quantity produced. And this marginal cost of production for different quantities is called the supply curve. And where the demand and the supply curve intersect, we have got the optimal price and quantity for a product that works for both buyers and sellers in the marketplace, and we call this market equilibrium. But when it comes to healthcare, there's a few reasons why the markets don't work. Let's take a quick look at a few of them. Firstly, allocative efficiency assumes that there's perfect competition. In other words, there's lots of buyers and sellers and no one entity can control the prices. And this requires that there aren't any significant barriers to entering the market. In the case of healthcare provision, you can't just quickly decide to become a doctor and compete with other doctors. You have to go to medical school and study for years and years and years. In other words, it's a barrier to enter into the marketplace. You also can't quickly start up a new hospital and compete with other hospitals in the area. Aside from the cost, there are substantial and necessary regulatory hurdles to overcome. And so healthcare providers that are already in the market can set prices higher than would be the case in a perfectly competitive market environment. Secondly, allocative efficiency also assumes that there is perfect information. This means that buyers and sellers know everything about the products, the costs, the benefits, the alternatives, etc. In healthcare, consumers know a lot less about healthcare than the providers. In fact, the consumers and the patients usually trust the healthcare provider and purchase whatever it is that's being suggested. This is called supplier-induced demand. And again, it allows providers to sell more than they might have if all of their patients had medical degrees and were able to make informed decisions about what they should purchase. Then we've got the problem of third-party payment. Because health insurance companies fit the bill for healthcare, neither the supplier or the consumer is primarily concerned with how much healthcare is being consumed or at what cost. In fact, both healthcare providers and patients are incentivized to want more healthcare to be provided, whether it's needed or not. Providers make more money and patients, because they don't have medical degrees, err on the side of more is better. Insurance companies try to find ways to realign these incentives, but empirical data shows that this never really works well. It adds substantially to administrative costs, it increases frustration, and simply translates into both providers and consumers trying to game the system. Then we have what's called adverse selection. Insurance pools work very well for the people that are on the needier end of the spectrum, but are terrible value for money for people that are healthier. So the healthier people drop out of the pool, making the average state of health in the pool a little worse. So the shared cost within the pool goes up a little. And again, there will be a cohort left within the pool that are at the healthier end of the spectrum for whom, at the new cost, they are receiving poor value for money and will drop out. And so the average health in the pool goes down slightly and the average cost goes up and so on and so on. And this isn't just theoretical. When you take a step back, countries that rely heavily on private healthcare provision spend a lot more on healthcare at a national and individual level and the overall health outcomes are worse. And of course, people who are not insured or underinsured also live with the fear of unexpected health expenses driving them into poverty. But regardless of whether it is privately provided or state provided healthcare, there are factors that impact on the overall supply and demand for healthcare. Let's take a look at them now. Firstly, factors influencing the demand for healthcare. We've got demographic factors like an aging population. As people get older, they generally need more healthcare. And population growth, more people means more demand. 
There are epidemiological trends like chronic disease. The rising conditions like diabetes and heart disease means more people need ongoing care. And of course, pandemics like COVID-19 lead to sudden spikes in healthcare demand. There are socioeconomic influences like income levels. People with higher income are often more likely to use healthcare services and education and healthcare literacy. People who are better informed tend to seek preventative healthcare more. There are cultural and behavioral factors, so cultural attitudes can have a big impact on whether or not people seek medical help. Insurance coverage and out-of-pocket costs. High out-of-pocket costs can deter people from seeking necessary care, where services that are free at the point of use tend to increase demand. Now let's look at factors influencing the supply of healthcare. Firstly, the healthcare workforce. And here we have the availability of healthcare professionals. So having enough doctors and nurses and specialists is crucial. In low-income countries, there often aren't enough healthcare workers. Richer countries often recruit from poorer countries, making the problem worse in low-income. And of course, there's training and education systems. Good training and education is key to making sure that there's a steady supply of healthcare professionals. Next, there's infrastructure and technology. So hospital capacity, for example, the number of healthcare facilities affects how much healthcare can be provided. And then there's access to medicines and medical technology. Access to advanced medical equipment can improve care, of course, but it can be expensive and hard to maintain, especially in low-income countries. And of course, there's politics, policy, and economic factors. Public investment can help expand healthcare supply. In low-income countries, international support from organizations like the World Bank and the Global Fund make a significant difference. Hope you have a great day. I hope that was helpful. Speak to you soon. Take care.